Today we begin the sixth Sunday journey through the season of Lent. A journey where we will look at race. Six different ways in which God's unmerited favor comes to us. Unmerited favor. Favor we can't earn. Favor we can't win. Favor we can't stop. Kind of like the sunlight that flows from the sun. You can't keep the sun from shining. You can't keep the rain from falling. You can't keep God's grace from being given to you. You can't. And that's what we're going to look at. Six different ways in which that unmerited favor of God comes to you and comes to me. Today, we're going to look at the unmerited welcome that is extended to you and to me by God's grace. When I was in seminary uh, uh, an eon ago, we had a variety of different pressing issues in the life of the church at that time. One of those pressing issues was a proposal that was coming to the National Church, to the General Assembly, to allow children to take communion. To allow children to take communion. Now in our church, ever since I've been here, that's been our practice. But it wasn't always that way. In fact, the Presbyterian Church, because we came out of the mother church, the Roman Catholic Church, 500 some years ago, we brought with us a lot of the practices that had been a part of the Roman Catholic tradition, including certain practices that were restricting of access to the sacraments until certain requirements had to be fulfilled. So, for example, children could not come to the table until they had gone through a communicants class or a confirmation class. <coughs> only then were you allowed to come to the table, because only then, as the theory went, would you really understand what you were doing when you did that. Now, some of you may not realized that the Presbyterian Church in its early years, even though it did not practice a rite of confession in the same form that the Catholics did, still used confession in a similar way to grant or deny access to the table. Instead of going <coughs> to a confessor at church, you would have an interview with the pastor the week before communion, and if you passed muster in the pastor's judgment, you got a little token. And then when you came up to the table, you had to give that token back to the pastor before you got the bread and the cup. Restriction on access to grace, the grace of the sacrament, has been a part of our history. But the other thing about the Presbyterian Church, USA at least, is that we call ourselves a Reformed Church that is always reforming. That's our motto. The Reformed Church, always reforming. And so part of what that means is that we are open to reconsidering previously held perspectives about things like children coming to the communion table. And so when I was in seminary, that was what we were doing. We were under that, we were in that process of debating and discussing and, and, and throwing scripture lessons back and forth at one another to prove that our perspective was the right and righteous one. And in the end, what won the day for children having access to this table was the scripture that we just read. Because if, if this table is about access to the real presence of Christ, then how is it? How is it that the real presence of Christ himself did not deny children access? And we will. 
And ultimately, that argument could not be overcome. Yes, there were those who said, but they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand this. I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. And you do? <laughs> you do? You, you completely understand the mystery of the sacrament and, and how it is nourishment for your soul and your spirit? You get it? You can understand it all? Of course you know. You never will. And neither will I. Because it's an unfolding experience of grace. It is transformed and changed and shaped and deepened every time we come to the table. Shaped by what we bring to that table when we come and shaped by what our experience of God has been up until that point in our life. And so it's always and constantly unfolding. And so it makes absolute sense that children would partake of this table and grow into that understanding just as every one of us does. Cleansing the table, restricting access to the means of grace, is unfortunately something that the church has done all the time, and still does, even today. Some churches don't let you come if you're not a member. Some churches still require some class. After all, we reason. If this grace cost Jesus his life, it should at least cost us a little bit of study time in order to have access to it. But that's exactly wrong. Exactly wrong. It's grounded in sense that we only should get things that we deserve or that we merit or that we earn. And that's a pretty deep-seated thing in us. Last week, we had Troop 52 here, right? Troop 52. And all those boys were marching down, doing their pledge, with their sashes across the front. And what do they have all up and down those sashes? What are they called? Merit badges, right? Buddy does not hand those out like stickers at a birthday party. you got to earn those babies. Don't you? It takes work and study and effort, and you don't get to put that patch on your sash until you've earned it. That's where that comes from, right? That seems right to us. That seems appropriate. It seems proper that we should have to earn benefits like that, which is exactly why we have such a hard time with grace. And it's exactly why, for two millennia, almost, the church has continued attempting to create ways to restrict people's access to grace. We continue, over and over again, to put requirements in front of people before they can have access to the full goodness of God. <laughs> but we come by that honestly. Christian church was born out of Judaism. And in Judaism, the presence of the Holy One was not in a sacrament like this, but in a place, the Holy of Holies, the very center room in the temple complex, which was a series of concentric rectangles, the most holy of which was a small room the very middle. And that room was understood to be where God dwelt. And in order for you to get into that room, you had to fulfill a progressive series of requirements for purification. Animals had to die for you to gain access to God. Animals had to die. And ultimately, to get into the Holy of Holies, a bull has to die. And the blood of that bull has to be carried in by the one priest who is selected among all the others for that one day of the week to go into the very presence of God. So, so we come from a tradition 
that was very, very clearly organized to graduate people's access to grace and to holy presence. Now, the early church experienced in Jesus the utter demolition of that system. But unfortunately, when the church became legalized by the Roman Empire, all the systems of the Roman Empire got brought into the memory of our Jewish heritage, and we started it all over again, creating constraints and restrictions and requirements for the access of grace. <clears throat> But think for a moment what Jesus did and how different that was, how utterly different that was. Were there any requirements to be a disciple other than getting up and following? I don't remember any of them going to seminary. I don't remember any of them going through a ordination committee process. I don't remember any of them going through any kind of process except a willingness to walk with Jesus and learn from him. That was it. And Jesus regularly welcomed people to his very presence and access to his power, his experience of God that Others didn't want him to experience having, giving access to the children, which we just read. But there's the story of blind Bartimaeus, who on the road to Jericho screams out, screams out, Son of David, have mercy on me! Son of David, have mercy on me! And what did the disciples do? They go, oh, there's, a, there's somebody who's sick. Come on over here. No. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Can't you see the master's on his way somewhere important? Shut up. And Jesus says, hey, 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 hey. Come here. Come here. What do you need? And he receives his sight. There's a woman who's been sick for 12 years. She has a flow of blood which makes her unclean. She's not supposed to be in public around people, because anybody she touches, she makes unclean, because she is unclean. It's like a contaminating cootie. So the only way she gets to Jesus is by hiding in the crowd and reaching out unbeknownst to anybody to touch the hem of his robe. And Jesus heals her and turns around, and she is scared to death of being condemned for being unclean, unable to have access to him. And he says, daughter, and raises her up and embraces her, and she is healed. Over and over again, Jesus welcomes the one others would keep away. He is regularly, consistently, deliberately <coughs> breaking through all of those fences of restrictions and requirements that were put between other people and God. Jesus came to eradicate that system, not to create a new one, to eradicate it so it was never necessary again. And everything he said and everything he did demonstrated the accessibility of God, not the distance, not the seclusion or the sequestering of God's presence. Jesus welcomes people to his table. Jesus welcomes people to his friendship. Jesus welcomes people to his power. Jesus welcomes people to his love 
felt that nobody else thought were worthy. Because it was not ever about worthiness. Sadly, we in the church, over the course of these millennia, have distorted even our understanding of Jesus' death on the cross and squeezed it into a system where we believe bizarrely, if we, if we look at it bizarrely, that God is so pissed with humanity that he's got to kill something in order for us to be able to have access. And he has to kill not only something, but his own kid in order to give us act. Now, that's it's honestly a little weird. Because do you think God's love for us has changed? Do you think God's love for us is, is any less now or was any less at any time than it was from the very beginning when God made us? No. God's love has not changed. Now, hear me. Hear me clear, because this is the most important thing I want to tell you today. The most important thing. Jesus came. Not to change God's mind about you, but to change your mind about God. So that you can...